Today's lecture is on sensation, and the next lecture is on perception. They kind of go together, sensation and perception, but I broke them apart. So this is the beginning of the stuff for exam two. Now, sensation, I have this definition over here. Just keep in mind it's about detecting. Do I detect like a light or maybe a smell or something else like a sound? And then I send it to my brain. So we know with light, it goes to the back part of the brain. I hope you remember this because the back part is the occipital lobe, right? And so sensation is always an afferent process because we're detecting information with our eyes, ears, other senses, and then sending this information onto the brain. Now, the other part of this, if I can get off of this cutesy stuff, is my favorite part, the next lecture, putting it all together. So what if I detect a smell or a sound or something? What does it all mean? Let me get off of that. Sensory threshold is this. It relates to the threshold of excitation. Let me just use hearing as an example. I think I have this sound on here. Can y'all hear that sound? I hope so. It should be a little bit barely detectable, but I could make that sound so faint that you couldn't detect it. So sensory threshold is the bare minimum of something that you can detect. For hearing is the bare minimum sound. For light is the dimmest light your eyes can detect. And that's different for different people, especially me because I'm kind of deaf on this ear. And so I can't detect sounds that you probably can. So I have it on here, the bare minimum you can detect. And that relates to the threshold of excitation because what's going to cause the neuron to fire from zero to one? Okay, just noticeable difference is also easy. It's like detecting the difference between two things. Now, in the morning, if you start taking a shower and you get used to the hot water, what's the minimum amount you have to adjust the hot water to notice a difference? Of course, if you yank on it, it's going to like adjust the difference. But what is the bare minimum you can detect between two things? Now, I'm kind of gayish and artsy, and so like the smallest difference to me is about colors. Like if I was going to look at this color right here and this one, it's like this one right here has more blue versus yellow in it, especially when you get closer and closer because I mix paints all the time and have to know the difference between colors when I paint. Okay, so signal detection theory, and then eventually I'll get into the senses, but for all of our senses, what can we detect? For instance, I want to keep with hearing because I've got a bad ear here. And so either there's a noise or not a noise. So in my hearing test over here, I've had to do this a million times. I'm going to punch the button yes or no. I hear the noise or I don't. Now, if there's a noise and I punch the button, hunky dory, I'm in the green. And if there, let me see if I did this right. But if there's a noise and I don't punch the button, that's the problem. I can't detect it. Now, my hearing test, I'm in the red down here a lot. Get a different color pen. Tim is here. Now, the other thing I start to do is I'll sit in the room and there is no noise. I think I have this on here. Oh, if there's no noise and I don't punch the button, that's this one. I, that's what I should do. There's no noise. I shouldn't be punching the button. But Tim's trippy ass will be sitting in the room going, I think I hear a noise. Am I hallucinating? No, I think that's a noise, is it? And I'll start punching the button when there's no noise there. And so I end up in these two quadrants, which means my hearing is bad, especially because I'm 40% deaf on this ear. <laughs> so anyway, if I can get off of this, it might be silly for Tim's hearing, but now let's just say the enemy plane, because in the military they use this. Uh, is he there or not? You don't want to be in the red because if you false alarm everybody's ass, everybody's going to be running around the military base mad at your ass. But if you miss it, everybody's dead. Pearl Harbor, you know what I mean? I don't want to get into this, but we can like talk about, you know, different scenarios. Okay, I hope that made sense. Now, if I and there are five senses, actually more than five, if I count the vestibular sense and all kinds of other senses. But anyway, I'm just going to talk about four major ones. Touch is one, but I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Remember, that goes to the parietal lobe. Now, if I... the first one that I want to talk about is vision. Our eyes detect light, which is an electromagnetic wave. Now, there's all kinds of waves. They don't detect radio waves or gamma rays. But right in here, this little spectrum, 
this uh, frequency, our eyes can detect the colors of the rainbow, which are Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, so you probably already know this, but this is what these things detect. Let's talk about this in further detail, this whole wave theory that I'm going with. If we look at the sine wave, it has two characteristics. One of the characteristics is the difference between these two waves. I'm going to try to illustrate this. See the distance right here and here from top to top? I could have done it from, yeah, I got a pen, which makes it better, bottom to bottom. That's pretty long. Now the distance over here is kind of short, right? From here to here is not as big as this one right over here. Hopefully this makes sense. Okay, so let me get this off of here. What this is known as is wavelength. And so wavelength determines the color. This is why red is a slow moving light right here because it's real far apart. And violet, Roy G. Biv, as you get closer to V, is a faster moving line. It's hauling ass. This has to do also with frequency. So sometimes instead of calling it wavelength, I will call it frequency, but the wavelength determines the color. Slower ones are towards red and faster ones are towards violet. Okay, so anyway, if I look at how many waves move through a second of time, this is why it's related or a functional frequency. You don't have to know this for the test, but hertz or frequency and everything is measured in hertz. Think about your TV, your computer, how fast it is. How many waves go through there in a second? So see, in this one second, a hell of a lot of violet waves are going through and only one, two, three, and maybe a half, maybe four red ones are going through about that okay the other feature of the wave is how tall it is how tall it is is called see right here this one's taller than the other one is amplitude amplitude determines the brightness they both have equidistant see wavelength so they're both right here going to be red but in this case determines how bright of a red this is. Now, if you're like me, a computer junkie, especially yeah. Photoshop and stuff like this, you're an artist, there's the HSV or HSB curve. And over here, usually on most computer programs, if you have to do something in color, they'll make you pick right here, the wavelength that determines the color, right? Hue, hue is a fancy word for color. And then brightness is determined by how tall the wave is. So then you're determining the amplitude. And so that's that feature. Saturation, so brightness right here would be how tall the wave is. Is it like this or is it real, real tall? I don't know if that's making sense. The third thing, saturation is about opacity, how things, how see through the things are. Okay, so enough about that but one last thing i forgot i was going to tell you if you think about old school radios a m f m amplitude modulation frequency modulation the two characteristics of a wave okay here we are at our eyeball finally <laughs> this is one of the last big parts you know biology the eye and the ear and then uh, taste and uh, smell are so easy i'll spend like three minutes on them Okay, so I'm just going to tell you the white part of your eye right here is called the sclera. You can't see the writing that's blocking the thing right now. Uh, the iris is the colored part. I don't have to tell you about this, but this is what I'm going to call the stargate. I don't know if you've seen stargate, but this is an old movie. It's the gate. Because not only is it colored, there's all these muscles that are in here that can make it get smaller or bigger because the black part you know is the pupil but it's not really a part it's like the hole of a donut so the donut can get you know have a bigger hole or a smaller hole and that's what's letting the light in if you're a photographer especially old school that's the aperture on your camera so now you can see over here as the light's coming through it's going to come through your eyeball and eventually come to the back and now your eye can open that's why that your eyes get dilated, but now they can do that thing. The last time, two times I went to the eye doctor, they don't have to put those drops in your eye. But if they dilate them, I can look in there because I've opened up the stargate. 
But then if you come out of the movies, like your eyes go, oh my God, I feel like a vampire, and they close down. As far as the test is concerned, you need to know this slide. Now, you don't need to know the sclera because that's just the white part of your eye. And the choroid is just how your eye gets fed blood and the nutrients it needs and all this other kind of stuff. Okay, so I don't know about those. You don't need to know about those. Okay, so light, remember, is going this way and it's gonna hit right back here on the sweet part of your eye, the fovea. I'll get to that one in a minute. But we did talk already about these two, the iris and the pupil. The pupil is just a hole in the donut. So see, you can't really see a donut from its side. I'm not picking a good color, let me pick yellow. But this here and this here would be the beginning of this stargate. On its side, it would open and close this way. Okay, hopefully that's not confusing. I'll show you a different picture. Okay, here we go. Third part, you need to know the cornea. What does the cornea do? It's this protective outer coating. Now I can do a better job than I can in class. And it looks clear, but it's like the face on the watch. Now it does protect your eye, but it starts the focusing. So that's very important because if you have vision problems, a lot of times it's corneal. I'll get to that too. Now the lens is easy. What does a lens on a camera do? Focuses, <laughs> okay? So this starts the focusing, this finishes the focusing. This big ass thing right here is the lens. Okay, so like once again, let me get all that off of there. Okay, so once the light goes through the lens, oops, I forgot about the uh, next part, ciliary body. The ciliary body, let's see if I can get this color. See these little things right here? And they have these little hair fibers on them. It's a muscle with a hair fiber that's attached to the lens. And what it does is it yanks on the lens or it pushes on the lens, which is called accommodation. And that's how your eye focuses. Now on a camera, we're used to doing this number, but in this case, it's yanking and pulling to do the focusing. And then once it focuses, now I do need to get a different color. The light's gonna come back here and hit on the sweet spot. And so once the light hits right back there, it didn't do a very good job on my arrow. That's when we detect the information and send it onto our brain. Okay, so I hope I made a little bit of sense, but I'm going to review a lot of this. So the retina is just the back part of our eye that's seen in red right here. This red part. Dang, I'm not doing a good job on my pens. I can't figure out which one to get. This red part that's right back here. And that's where the neurons for vision live. And so if a neuron detects light, meets the threshold of excitation, it fires. A bunch of neurons are known as a nerve, right? And you have two eyes, and so you have these two nerves or cables that run out of your eyeballs and go back to your head. And where are they going to end up? Occipital lobe, like I taught you last time. So now I'm starting to put everything together, the pieces that I've taught you. Now, if you didn't get all that right now, oh, the phobia, last thing. That's the sweet spot of, uh, spot of your eye. Uh, that's where most of your neurons are kind of uh, bundled. And so your eye naturally tries to hit that sweet spot because you'll be most in focus. You have the greatest visual acuity in the phobia. Okay, I like this picture even better. One of the reasons I like it, because see right here, the cornea, that clear coating is slightly bent in the light. I didn't do a good job of drawing right there. And then the lens right here does the majority of the work to fine tune it right here to the fovea, right? Remember the sweet spot, because this is the retina that contains all the light sensitive part of your eye. I call it the film sometimes. I haven't used that before, I don't think. but. I like to show this picture again because it shows the donut hole the best, even though it's an old school picture. Because that's this piece right here and you can't see it on its side. That's why I kept saying you can't see the stargate right. Here's the stargate, it's terrible drawing. But here you can see it and now you can see the stargate up on this one if I can draw right. And you can see the hole in the donut and that can get bigger or smaller because of all these muscles that are in your iris. So you got muscles in your iris, but down here, remember, the ciliary body has muscles and it yanks or pulls on the lens to focus it on the fovea because it has the most uh, neurons there. It's the sweet spot. And then a bunch of neurons are a nerve and it goes back to the back of your head. 
occipital lobe. We talked about that last time. Here's a, another picture. This one's old school, but at least it's here's the candle. It's going to be detected right back here on your fovea. But first of all, it goes to the cornea. Let me get a different pen again. And it bends it. Real exaggerated bend. And then when it gets to here, the lens inverts it, but it puts it right back here on the fovea. Now let me erase all that so you can at least see the way it looks. Okay, so here's where the light sensitive neurons are, and these neurons are going to bundle together and send that information back to your brain, which is the occipital lobe. I'm far sighted. I don't know if some of y'all are near sighted. That means that you can see near good and far bad. Right? So let me get on to this one first of all, near sighted. The idea is that your cornea is too roundy. It's exaggerating the bend too much for uh, far images. So no matter how much work your ciliary body does to yank or push on that lens, the sweet spot's right here, and it needs to be right here. Now there's two different ways I say that I can make a projector in my classroom fuzzy. One is doing this, with, so that would be like the yanking and pulling of the lens. The other is I could walk the screen back and forward in the class and move the screen to the sweet spot, but you can't move the screen to the sweet spot on your eye. Now back down to here, far side. I can see far just fine. I can read a poster across the room, but if I have to read a menu, I can't see it. Why? Because maybe my cornea is too flat. It doesn't bend the light at all. Now my lens has a lot of work to do. It's yanking and pulling all I can. And no matter how much I squint, the sweet spot's right back here do or contacts they pre-bend the light or help your cornea out so if i tried to read a newspaper on this side it's going to like the sweet spots back here but now if i have my glasses on the sweet spot is just where it's supposed to be one last sick i think if i have this on here yeah <clears throat> what they do in lasik is they come over here and they cut your front part of your cornea off. Oh, that grosses me out. <laughs> and then they get in here and they'll shave parts off. Like for me, they'd make it more roundy because now I wouldn't have to struggle. And now the sweet spot would be right here because now this is roundy instead of real, real flat like it used to be, if any of that drawing just made sense. But if you're nearsighted, it's because it's already too roundy. So they get in there and they shave your eyeball down until it's like flatter. And then you can see better. It's like, ooh, wee, is that weird? But that's how it works. This is one of the last things on the anatomy part of the eyes, the retina. I keep calling it the film of your eyes, the light sensitive part. That's where the neurons live. And you have two different kinds of neurons. I won't write neurons out, but here they are right here, the two different kinds of neurons that live in the retina. One are long and skinny, these right here. Let me erase this part right here off of here. And those are called rods. Rods are for black and white. And I always think about different animals. And I see a lot of owls. This is a real picture that I took. And owls might have more rods than cones because they have to be night hunters a lot of times. And uh, rods are not just for black and white or night vision. It's also for peripheral things I see in the edge of my vision. Edge vision. Now, we're more creatures of the day, so we have a lot more cones. Cones are for color, and they kind of look like maybe an ice cream cone right here. And so if I can get all this writing off here for the test, just remember we have black and white detector neurons and color detector neurons. And so I'm going to go into these in more detail later on when we talk about color vision. Okay, you can see the fovea, if we were looking at the back of your eye, this would be like looking at this piece right here, dead on. The center of your eye is almost all rods and cones. I mean, all cones, sorry about that. And the rods kind of live out here on the donut part, on the edge or the periphery. This is a real picture of a retina, and if you blow up on an electron microscope, you can actually see now the cones are real fat, and the rods are nice and tall and skinny right here. Now the last thing, oh yeah, I have this on here. Too bad we're not in class. 
It's like, whatever, remember we're contralateral, whatever I see on the right hand side of the field of vision, J-Lo goes over here, Nicole Kidman goes over here, right? We talked about this. So you have two eyeballs and the two cords come out of your head and they cross. Where do they cross? At the chiasm. Chiasm comes from chi, X, Greek word for X, and so there's an X, and then eventually they end up at the back of your head. Really, they go to the thalamus. Okay, so it's not really that you're truly contralateral, though. And this is where I usually tell a story that's inappropriate, but one time I had a girl in class, and I was giving this lecture, and she had damage where she was completely didn't have an eyeball, and so she only had one eyeball. It's like, well, you can see both sides of the room, can't you? And she goes, of course I can, Tim. <laughs> if you close your eye, one eye, can you see both sides of the room? So you're not truly contralateral, but it does cross for some information. Whatever you see it on the right hand side of the room with both eyes does go to the left side. And whatever you see over here with both eyes does go to this side. Okay. But this picture I love because see here's the light coming in. It would go through the stargate and then your lens would pull or push on it. The first thing would happen is the cornea would bend it right. And then your lens would pull or push on it. And then as it got back here to the retina, there's like either rods or cones that would start firing. Here's the optic nerve. You have two of them. They cross, right? They end up at the thalamus, really have kind of two thalami, if that's the right way to say it. And then in thalamus is the male room and says, where does it go? Right back here, occipital love. Booyah, I love that. So here, I think I have this on your notes. You have the two cables, they cross over, I'm not doing a good job right here, but they cross over right here. And that cross is the X. Here's the two thalami right here, if I can get a different pin. And then it goes to the back, all the way to the back. Okay, so that's everything for that part or that section right there. Okay, this is the last section on vision, but this is the one most people want to know about, which is color vision. How do we see in color? What are the cones all about? Remember, it's the cones, not the rods. Test. We're talking about cons. Now, this doesn't always make sense to me, but how you see in color is based on light shining in your eyes, not painting. I'm a painter and mix paints. Now, mixing blue light and green light to get turquoise up here, if I can get my pen on, that makes sense. And blue plus red makes purple. But green plus red making, yeah, that doesn't make sense. And if I shine all the lights together, it makes what? But most the computer screen you're on right now doesn't have white or black. It's just the RGB unit, most likely. And if you think about it, if I put all the light back together, I get white light. Remember, I took it apart to get Roy G. Bit. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to Tim either. Okay, so using these three colors, I can make all the flavors of the rainbow right here. Now, the first theory... It's trichromatic, and I just said three colors, three color theory. If you look at three color theory, it says that we see these three colors because we have three kinds of cones. This says cones over here, three kinds of cones. Some are blue. They only detect blue light. So the if you shine a red light in there, that ain't going to do nothing to that. You know what I mean? But if you shine a blue light in there, this one's going to go crazy. Same thing with this one for a green light and this one for a red light. Now, that all makes sense. What don't make no sense is if I shine a yellow light in your eye, this one and this one go up. That don't make no sense. But see, this is from a real theater where they're shining a green and a red light to get yellow. Besides that, Second theory, opponent process. That should remind you of something, antithesis. So this antithesis was a different theory because they said, well, your theory is pretty good, but what about colorblind people? Like my dad is red, green, colorblind. Why can he see yellow? Okay, so that's a problem with the first theory, trichromatic, that the second theory tried to address, not the only. Okay, so they say that you have two kinds of cones and one of the kinds of cones detects both blue and yellow. And another one detects both red and green only. And the third one is not a cone because this is a rod. 
Okay, so that's not color theory. Now, these two kinds of cones, you go, how can it detect both? Well, I don't know if you fucked around with computer equipment enough, but one time I could have a switch where I switched it up for red, down for green, middle off. Same thing, up for blue, down for yellow, middle off. Now, you see illusion right here in class, but I don't know how good it's going to work. You're supposed to stare at this American flag for as long as you can. I'll leave it up for a few seconds. Now, as you stare at it, maybe the closer you are, the better it's going to work on a computer because in the classroom it's real big. What is going to happen is going to be the after image, the opposite of this image. Well, what's the opposite of red? I mean, green, it's red. What's the opposite of black? White. What's the opposite of yellow? Blue. So you should see the regular American flag. Did you see it? I don't know. I saw it, but I put my face right before the computer. Maybe you can rewind and try it again. Okay, so the idea is that green has been firing, and so has yellow, and so has black a lot. Now when you take them away, they should go back to this middle point right in here. But they don't go back to the middle point. They kind of overshoot the mark for a second because, you know, they you know have been firing for a while. And then they come back and rectify in the middle. I hope that that part of the lecture made sense. Okay, the next part of the lecture is on hearing, which is near and dear to my heart because I have ear problems. And I'll end up at the ear doctor staring at the uh, ear poster on the wall. But when I talk about hearing... I have to talk about sound, and sound travels as a wave, not electromagnetic, but it travels as a pressure wave through the air. And so it can has two attributes, just like we talked about before, it can travel fast or slow. I like fast or slow better than using the term wavelength, but wavelength and frequency are functions of one another, like I talked about last time. Now, I think I have some sounds on here. Can you hear that sound? Maybe I didn't make it loud enough. Now that's real high and pitchy. Now this sounds not high and pitchy. See, it's low and gongy. So the lower a sound is, the slower it moves. That makes perfect sense to me because I grew up like tearing apart speakers or if I have look in the back of my car, I have a 10 inch subwoofer that's run off a 500 watt amp, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so my Mini Cooper rocks. But you know, tweeters, which haul ass, that's the pitchy part, the high pitch part, and woofers move slow. But this makes perfect sense to me, a lot better sense kind of than vision. Now, if you look at music, once again, waves per second, this is why I'm always looking at frequency, because frequency to me is a better, you know, measure than wavelength, because see, one hertz is one wave per second three waves per second, like 60 megahertz, you know, that kind of stuff that they measure computers and TVs in. And so if you're a musician, see down here, A is at 110 hertz uh, waves per second, 220, 440, an octave of A is a function of one another. I don't know if any of this makes sense, but to me it's fast. Okay, enough of that. The other function of the wave, which is real easy, the taller the wave, amplitude, AM, FM, uh, that means I'm turning the shit up. Like, I turn my shit up. You know what I mean? I'm not kidding. Like, I listen to a lot of gangster rap and EDM, and I'm turning up Grizz, and I'm turning up, you know, Big Gigantic, and I'm gonna fucking rock that shit, you know? But that's what my shit is about. So, anyway, those are the two functions of a way. Now, here's your ear. It detects sound. Here's the poster I'm always looking at. This is what I call my ear, this big ass thing on the outside of my head. That's the funnel or the penna, part one. It funnels the pressure waves into your ear. Now I can teach this better. I do like some parts of the computer. This is your ear canal where you're not supposed to stick like a Q-tip way up in there, but I've done it before. But I do have problems right here at my tympanic membrane. This is the thing that starts vibrating first, which is called your eardrum. You know all this stuff so far. This is why the ear is so much easier than the eye. Okay, so tympanic, tympanum, there's like a tympanum drum or whatever it is. So here we go. Now you have these three little bones, but also means bone, ossicles, and those are like the amp, 
like the amp I have in my car. It's going to like take that weak message, clean it up, and send that message on to the part that does most of the work. This part right here, which does include the whole part right here, if you can see my drawing. Let me get off of that. I picked the wrong thing, which is the cochlea. I call it the snail. All the action happens in the snail for the test. Because the ear canal and the funnel, I mean, what else can you say? This little thing vibrates and then it sends the vibration here. Okay, it's the amp. That's so easy peasy. I hope you're with me so far. Okay, what I want to do now is uh, blow this part of the cochlea up in detail. And it's going to cut a little piece off right here so you can see inside of it. So hopefully you follow me. You don't need to know all of this, but I just want to go into detail. Inside of the cochlea is filled with liquid. So when the amplifier, these three little bones, start to jiggle the snail, I know that's not real scientific, it's jiggling that liquid in there. Okay, and so those three canals are filled with liquid. Now I don't want to go into detail. I usually show a movie, but here's the one, two, three canals. And so it's right in here that I'm going to focus my attention on, right here, the organ of corti. And if you notice, like on one side of it, I don't know if you can see, it says hair cells. And so I'm going to blow this little piece up. I hope so far. Now see, here's the hair cells right here on one side, and the other side don't have them. And now what happens is, when that liquid starts to move right here, then those hair cells start to move in the liquid. Let me get this down. And they kind of brush against the other side. Are y'all with me so far? This is why I believe in God. <laughs> and when they brush against the other side, these are the dendrites receiving information. And see the dendrites right here, cell body, then it goes into the axon, and the axon will go back to your brain, the thalamus, the male room, and then hearing and smell go to the temporal lobe on the side. Booyah, here we go again, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hopefully I did a good job, but what fascinates me is the whole reason I hear is because these little hair cells are getting moved by liquid in this snail, and that those hair cells are brushing on the other side, and that's what's causing the sensation of hearing. Now, two different things. As I get older, because I've been to way too many heavy metal concerts and raves and all kinds of other crazy ass shit, like festivals, it's like... You wear your broom out. You've been brushing that broom, especially for high frequency sounds. And I don't know if you know about those cell phone rings that older people can't hear, but young people can because you haven't worn your broom out yet. The other thing is if you have ringing in your ears sometimes, one of those little hair cells right here is getting stuck up there and it's telling your brain you're hearing a sound when you're not. It drives me crazy, but that's what it is. Okay, I hope I did a good job right there. Keep in mind, the liquid moving the hair cells inside of the snail, the cochlea, is why you hear. Now, oh, I have it right. Okay, so only one theory of hearing, and then we'll be done for hearing. Like I said, I thought it was a lot easier. So here comes the sound over here into your ear. It hits the eardrum right here, if you can see what I'm drawing right here. And it goes through this right here, the amp. I do like teaching this way a little bit better because I can draw. Maybe if I picked a better color. And then it goes into the, the snail. You're not really seeing all the stuff. Here's where I would show a movie right here. But just whatever. Okay, so if I get that all like erased off of there. Down here in the snail, then here's the theory. That if something hits right in here, you're going to hear a high frequency noise. You can't quite see it over here. But if something, see here, this is 3,000 waves per second. This is 20,000 waves per second. But see, bases are way down in here. And see, here's where I wear my broom out is right in here because all the high pitch noises I've heard at concerts. That's why those cell phone rings don't work for me but work for young people. I don't miss out on bases. I'll hear bass all day long in my car, you know what I mean? Because it's only moving at 200 waves per second. Okay, and so in a way, it's kind of like right in here as I spin out. 
See how I'm doing the cochlea up here? I'm spinning out like a piano, and you know how on a piano, one end is high pitchy and one end is low, whichever end is what, and so it would go all the way out. I couldn't make my cutesy little keyboard go all the way out. I hope this theory of uh, hearing makes sense. If you have any questions on that one, definitely give me an email. Okay, the very last section. I hope you're still with me. I'm getting kind of tired, but anyway, the vestibular system has to do with the top of the snail. It's not really about hearing, which is the bottom part, the cinnamon roll that I call, but this top part, I always forget that I have this up here already, this top part that I have circled has a little nerve that comes off of it, the vestibular nerve, which is about our sense of balance and orientation. Now, what part of our brain might that talk to? Cerebellum at the back, the bell in the so here's the top part, and it has three, one, two, three little canals, and they just so happen to be filled with liquid, and when they move, the liquid moves, it moves little hair cells, and it touches the other side. And these three canals are perfectly 90 degrees from each other, orthogonal. I, this makes me believe in God that I have this little thing in my head, and that has these three canals that are filled with liquid, that have little hair cells on them. As I move in one direction, like in and out, or side to side, or if I move up and down, then those hair cells move accordingly. Trippy. Okay, I hope you like that part of the lecture. The last two senses I talk about are very easy. Taste and smell both work on chemical molecules coming in contact with either your tongue or the lining in your nose. They're not waves like electromagnetic waves or pressure waves like we talked with hearing or vision. Now with taste, you have four kinds of neurons according to this theory, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter neurons. And the bitter ones live more at the back and you don't have to know this. The sweet ones towards the front. There's all kinds of tongue maps and controversy over which one is right. But I just think about if I eat a grapefruit. Let me have a, see if I can get it on here. Now what's going to go off? Well, probably some sweet, maybe some sour and bitter, right? Those things would go off. One time someone asked me in class, what about a pepper? And it's like, well, when I looked it up, it says, yeah, combinations of these things go off over here in addition to the pain receptors in your tongue, depending upon how hot the pepper is. Okay, so enough about When you look at your tongue, there's these bumps on there. I used to call those my taste buds, but they're really papillae. Papillae, plural, or papilla, singular. Now, this is why taste is easy. you got these bumps. Inside or between the bumps, I should say between the crevices between the bumps, I should pick a different color. Right here are these little canyons, and you can see the taste buds are these little circles that live in between the bumps. Now, the taste buds to me kind of look like an onion over here. And so if something was salty and it landed on this one, and that's a salty taste bud, it would fire if it met the threshold of excitation, salty enough. But if it was a sweet receptor and the salt landed on it, not going to fire, just like shining a red light onto a blue cone. I hope you're following my logic. Okay, so here's the bumps on your tongue, and in between the bumps is where the taste buds live. The reason I thought those were my taste buds is one time I ate a whole pack of sour warheads and it says right on the package, don't do it. <laughs> and it would inflame those bumps real big and I kept saying, my taste buds, you know, and probably my taste buds were damaged, but the bumps are the papilla. Okay, so here is, this one shows the canyon better. See, here's the canyon and here, right here is one of them, a taste bud. Oh, I didn't know I had it circled. Okay, here we go. So taste goes this way, it goes through your mouth, of course, and it goes up here and it ends up at the parietal lobe. That should be pretty easy. Okay, so now it works in combination with smell, like if you have a cold or whatever, you have problems with smell. Okay, so I have this uh, little chart I usually show on here because both the chemicals go into your tongue and up your nose, kind of like you're eating an orange, for instance. And so what they did is blindfold people, but some people, they plug their nose up, the ones in blue. Whiskey freaks me out. If I'm blindfolded and you have my nose plugged up, I can't tell I'm drinking whiskey. But look at coffee right here. Oh, my goodness. They can't tell at all. Or even eating a piece of garlic. That's weird. OK, 
Okay, so both have to work in combination. So the last one, smell. I told you taste was easy. You got bumps on your tongue that contain the taste buds, and there's four kinds of taste buds, bitter, sour, sour salty, and sweet. Smell is even easier because if I can get onto this thing, if I were going to smell a rose, the scent, of course, is going to go up your nose and come in contact with this part of your nose. And that part of your nose is right in here. I blew it up right here. And you can see those little dendrites sticking out. And this first piece is called the olfactory epithelium. And the olfactory is just the fancy word for smell, sense of smell. So smell, epithelial tissue is just a, a certain kind of sensitive tissue we have in all these different areas of our body, I think. I'm not the best on anatomy and physiology. But in this epithelial tissue, that's where the neurons for smell live. Now, I can't just go bitter, sour, salty, sweet, red, green, blue. There's so many different ones, and they're so complex. I mean, you could do general ones like floral, citrus, you know what I mean, if you do all those atomizers and things like that. But the neurons bundle together at the olfactory bulb. Remember, olfactory is just a fancy word for smell. Smell bulb, smell tissue. And then olfactory nerve, smell nerve. <laughs> and so that one's so easy because if you just like don't focus on this word right here and just focus on you have a tissue that contains the neurons that bundle together and a bunch of neurons are a nerve into the stomach. So if you look at it over here, as the, the smell of the rose goes up into your nose, it comes in contact with this area. And I like this picture the best. Why? Dendrites, axons, terminal buttons at the bulb, they all bundle together. A bunch of uh, neurons or a nerve, and a nerve goes back that way. And smell and hearing are temporal lobe. Look at it this way smell is the only one that doesn't go to the mail station. Why? Because it's already right here. And some people say that's why our smell is most directly tied to our memory because it's like a direct pipeline. Anyway, that's everything for today's lecture. I know it was a long lecture, but that's the last of biology. The next lecture is going to be on perception.